Welcome to The Why with James Sue. My guest this week is Monica Macias. Monica is the daughter of Equatorial Guinea's first president, Francisco Macias, and was actually raised in North Korea by none other than Kim Il-sung, the leader of North Korea. She's got a new book out called Black Girl from Pyongyang, in which she chronicles this entire journey and later attempts to understand her father's complicated legacy. We're going to touch on all of Monica's past, what she's learned about herself, the nature of reality, privilege, historical context, and trying to understand different cultures. It is, in my opinion, quite a nuanced conversation, and it's my pleasure to bring it to you today on The Why with James Sue. Who is Monica Macias? So, I will begin with my name, full name. It is the, it's the combination of the European name, Christian, and then I have African name and my surname. So, my name is Monica, meaning Macias Bindang. And uh, I was born in a, a very small country in Western Africa, Western Central Africa, called Equatorial Guinea. It was um, Spanish colonial, to, colonial during um, 200 years until 1968 when uh, the country gained the independence from Spain. And my father was the first president of that country. So my father was the person uh, um, who won the election legitimate president, first president, who signed the independent declaration back then. And uh, however, I have another father as a politician who is a, who was North Korean um, founder and leader, Kim Il-sung. He's the person who raised me, who raised me up and uh, look after me when I was young. So, I was sent to study with my siblings in North Korea in 1979. And now you might ask, you might wonder why people, why my father would send us to North Korea so far in a North Asian country to study from, from uh, Central West Africa. So to understand that, I need to give you a bit of the... Uh, uh, background, historical event, what happened back then. So in 60, we are talking about, uh, we need to have a mind that it was the, the time when many African countries was getting independent from their colonizers, European colonizers. So Guinea, like I said earlier, was one of them. And uh, to make sh very short, the long story, Guinea, uh, the relationship between Guinea and Spain was not good. It was really, it was getting deteriorated day by day, I would say. For instance, Spain uh, tried to kill my father. They, they organized a coup d'etat and tried to fill, uh, kill my father in just three months after the independence because my father was not the candidate they wanted because my father was a nationalist and my father was to look after the uh, Equatorial Guinean interest rather than um, Spanish interest. So they tried to kill him, they failed, and that was the start point of breaking the relationship was really very bad. So at the same time that the decolonization, the context I'm giving you in the context Guinea was, and another another factor to take account is the is when the uh, Cold War was starting. So, and we all understand the Cold War was the a competition between uh, the Western country and communist bloc countries. So, uh, one when the independence in Africa 
decolonization started in the aftermath of the decolonization. Um, so Western countries, the, the relationship between Western countries and African countries was so bad. It wasn't only Equatorial Guinea, many countries in Africa, because the colonization meant so badly because meant very exploitation of those countries by colonial, uh, by these Western countries. So obviously the relationship and still until now is not good. And uh, at the same time, these uh, communist bloc countries was reaching out in African country with help. And what those countries were, Cuba, Russia, China, and North Korea was one of them. So North Korea also was reaching out in African country to help with them. And that's how my father got to relation between um, Kim Song, And then decided to send us because when uh, Spain gave independence to Guinea, they left overnight. It's like you can't leave a country that you have been... Um, exploding or explode not only exploding but practically black people have no right for study for any whatsoever so they left over the night and the country have had nothing no institution proper uh, education institution was left in the country so uh so my father decided to send young guineans uh, uh, to those countries, he sent to Russia, China, and North Korea to study many people. And we we were one of them. He he decided to send us to North Korea with, with Kim Il-sung. And uh, that's the reason I was sent to North Korea with a six age, uh, with, at the age of six. And I grew up in Pyongyang until... Uh, 1994, and I didn't know anything about about what 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 was happening back at home in in Equatorial Guinea. But later on, I learned that my father was executed, and uh, he was put in a trial of perpetrating um, of of killing mass killing in in the country, and but I wasn't aware of it. I learned that after. The, the reputation that my father had, the the um, my father had in a, in a, has in a, in a Western country. I learned it later on when I left Pyongyang in 1994. So mm -hmm. I decided to do when I so I left when I finished my studies. Uh, I so Kim Il Sung first of all Kim Il Sung gave us option if. Once we finished the study, we could stay in Pyongyang or we could go back or leave the country. And I decided to leave the country because I was really immersed in an identity crisis. As you can see, I am I am mixed race, black and white, because my mother is uh, um, uh, white uh, from Spain. And then uh, growing up in, in, in Asia, and so I had a, this very deep identity crisis I, and I wanted to know about myself and, and do research, learn about my my culture with these new cultures, but in theory, which is mine, African culture and European culture. So I decided to leave in 1994 and I arrived in, in, in Madrid first. Uh, my Spanish wasn't good, so I before I leave in Pyongyang, actually, I did a six year, six months of course, the Spanish course, and then I I yeah I left the country and I arrived in Madrid, but my Spanish wasn't good enough to look for look for um the job or do a, a proper investigation and communicate. And then on top of that, there was many, I was going through many changes, cultural shock and all this is, as you can, you can read it in the book, as I mentioned in the book. So, mm -hmm. 
that's a bit of the context uh, I am giving you now. Thank you. So there's so many things I want to follow up on, but I think first thing I want to ask is now as an adult woman, do you feel completely comfortable with your identity? You have mentioned just now being in so many different cultures, speaking so many different languages. At one point in time, I think you basically only spoke Korean when you lived in North Korea and then Spanish, you regained it. And of course, we're conversing in English. And I know language is not the only indicator of culture, but just as a cultural, your cultural identity, do you feel comfortable with it now with yourself? I do. I absolutely do. I feel comfortable with uh, who I am and with my identity, which is, it might sound weird for, for many who, for many people, if you haven't gone through identity crisis and uh, like I did. Um, so I feel, in order to understand that, you know, I feel, first of all, like a Korean, because it's the culture I grew up with. And I, it's very much embedded in me, inside. So if I have to put it in the level, it's like Korean culture is the embedded one where I feel very comfortable with it. And then comes um, European and uh, African cultures together. But what I notice is that I can mimic these two cultures, but they will never be inside me like the Korean culture it is. Because I grew up from six years old. It's the first language that I learned properly. And, uh, yeah, from six years old up to 24 years old, I lived in, in North Korea. It's completely Korean. I'm completely Korean. And, uh, and when I left, I learned these two other cultures, which is African and European. So they are on top of the Korean culture, but still cannot be, um, I don't feel it as mm. as I feel like in Korean. Yeah, the <laughs> Korean culture is just so deeply ingrained in yeah. you, right? Because mm. it's just it was just a, your childhood, and nobody can ever take one's childhood away. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and culture. Mm -hmm. but that's why I think I think that we we human. We, I think it. This is my view. Uh, you might disagree. I think we are from where I grew up, not from where we born. I think. Like, like my. I, I agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can <laughs> you can look like uh, you might look like uh, uh, Asian, but if you grew up in Canada, you're Canadian. You are Canadian. You might yes. still you might still understand Chinese culture or. Asian culture because it's part of you or maybe you have been exposed to it with your parents and friends there. But the place, the environment you grew up and, and education you had, it's Canada. And that's very much in, embedded in yourself. So that's exactly what happened with me. I'm very, I'm, I feel comfortable when I am in Korea, whether it's South Korea, whether it's North Korea, I feel very comfortable because it's part of me. It, the culture is part of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So many people listening to this may have, I mean, this is not even a, a wild assumption. So many people listening to this have never, ever been to North Korea. You grew up in North Korea in a period quite some time ago. I mean, can you describe what it was like I know, obviously, there's a lot of wonderful descriptions in the book, but just for those, for listeners, like, how would you describe it? If you could try to do it in maybe simple, general terms, like, what is it like to to grow up in North Korea? And what is North Korea like? Right. So um, I will put people in the context. So in order to understand Korea, I, like every time I said, Korea have... It's shade, and 
is a complex, uh, com complex society and country. So when we are to when we were sent to study in North Korea, it's 70. 70 and I stayed it until uh, early 90s. So the 70s and 80s actually f starting from after the war from 60, 70, 80, Korea was really doing well economically. And that this is a fact that um, if, if uh, anyone academic is uh, listening, can do the research, proper research, and there is a um, document that's showing how the country was doing economically much better than South Korea. So I grew up in that period. So there was no, it was booming. You could see it. And uh, 70, so I lived from late 70, early 80 up to um 1994. So it was nice. People are very kind. The country is very clean and beautiful, especially Pyongyang. Obviously, there is a huge difference between the countryside and the, and the city, Pyongyang, and uh, the capital. Uh, but since I grew up in Pyongyang, um, for me, it was it was very beautiful, very clean, very clean city. Uh, friends, people were really kind to us, and uh, I mean, I loved being with them, um, spending the time in the park, because Pyongyang has a lot of park where you can, on the weekend, you can go and do picnics, and people love going out to do picnics and doing the Korean, typical Korean barbecue and uh, spending time with family. They are very family oriented. North Korean are very, very much uh, family oriented, spending the time with family. And uh, yeah, most, um, but that's mostly when I was in uh, university because I grew up in, uh, mm -hmm. in a boarding school. So from 10, 10 or 12 years old, I was in boarding school. At that time, was more rather in boarding school. And then I was, um, we were more, um, how can I say, living in, a, from Monday to Friday, we were living in school. And the weekend, we could go out to spend the time with other foreigners who were in the city. Um, students from Syria, and uh, and in early eighties there were Eastern European students as well, and also we used to go travel to another other cities like Wonsan, Myeongsan. So it was quite good. It was really nice time. You mentioned that uh, Kim Il Sung was. The person who took care of you, really, I mean, just because of the relationship that Kim had with your, your father. Uh, one thing that I didn't quite get a very strong handle on when reading the book was just maybe the personal side of Kim or maybe more of your interactions with him. Can you describe him? I mean, I don't know if it's too much to say he was like a a father figure to you or like i don't know maybe just describe the 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 relationship a bit and and uh basically like who he's what he's like because it's also something that many people myself included just have no idea about yeah i am i understand and uh, that's the question many people i do and i try to keep it quite um uh private because it's a relationship um, but I can tell you like I, I mentioned in the book he was um, he was a, a like a father figure to us because when my father sent us he sent us with a, a letter one was written to for him written 
he wrote two letters, one to Kim Il-sung and one to us. And uh, in the letter, actually, was the same context. He said that he is sending us to Kim Il-sung, who will be responsible for of our education, and he will look up to us, and um, and he will decide where to send a, which school is a better for us to for the education, and then he he told us we should never forget about who who we are, and he emphasized that we are African, and um, also he he he. He said that once we finish the study, we should go back to Guinea and uh, and work for for Guinea. So, so yes, Kim Il Sung was uh, a a father figure for us, and he was there every time when we needed something. He was there, and we were able to communicate. And as I mentioned in the book, when he sent after sending us to um boarding school. In that boarding school, we could communicate with him over the phone and uh, through his nephew, because his nephew was the sub-director of the school back then. And he, the nephew was living in the school, and so in the campus of the school. His house was just next to, inside of the campus, because the campus was very, is very huge campus, and he had his nephew had a house there because he worked there as di uh, sub sub director, uh, deputy director. I think in English is deputy director. Yeah, and um, through him as well, we we communicated with him, and then he actually is a person for me. Is the person who kept his promise to his late friend, as opposite to. Fidel Castro, because my my father sent also my elder brother Tell to to Cuba, but Tell was sent back to Equatorial Guinea when mm. when my father died uh, was killed. But Kim Il Sung did did send us back. That makes that tells you a lot the difference between two leaders. Mm -hmm. But Kim Il Sung kept his uh, promise. Mm -hmm. to look after us until we became um, adult. So for mm -hmm. me, uh, that's Kim il -sung as a person. I know mm -hmm. I I tend to make... I was born in a... It might be because I was born in a polit, polit, uh, politician family and raised by a politician. So I I learned to make a difference between a person, a leader's person, a leader as a politician. So mm. that's that's what I can tell you about Kim Il Sung. Because Kim had such an impact on the evolution of North Korea. Mm. I mean, just just being the. I don't think it's wrong to say just being the absolute leader of yeah the country. He shaped the country's uh, history and destiny. One thing that's very interesting, I think, is a theme in the book, which is, you know, you go back and you try and understand or revisit history that that claims to be one thing, but then maybe turns out to be another after you do research or you try to dig into the facts. In terms of Kim and North Korea, like, mm -hmm. do people have misunderstandings about it? Did you have misunderstandings about it when you were younger and then you realize as you got older, like, oh, maybe it's not like that, either one way or the other? Like, I'm just wondering, are there things about North Korea that people may not know about or maybe that you didn't know about? Like, it, it's it's kind of a two-part question. Oh, yes, absolutely. Because, like I mentioned in the book, I grew up in a society, North Korean society is very eclectic society so the information outside information is not it's very selective it, it, in in any case it, it, if it comes in it's very selective so that's it, uh, almost none i would say outside uh information 
and the history that we learn, what history, um, I mean, Korean history we learn is, now I know it after the research, is very much just, um, in their view, it's, it's seen from their view, if, I, if that makes mm -hmm. sense, I, in favoring them, yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. I didn't know that until I visit. I visited Beijing in 1989, like I mentioned in the book. So I didn't realize that I was brainwashed. You don't know when you are growing up in a, in a. Let's let's let me explain it this way. You growing up, you grow you growing up only seeing one thing and believe in one thing and because it's been repeated to you since you are young when you get older you believe you end up believing that's the truth and uh because you didn't go outside of that that square where you live in it but once you go mm -hmm. out and you see outside you realize, oh, what I have been taught or what I haven't seen might not be absolute truth. That's the reason I started questioning when I went back to Pyongyang after visiting Beijing in, 19, in 1989. But this is something mm -hmm. that it happened in all societies. Regardless, we know or, or, or don't know or like it or dislike it. It happens in every mm -hmm. society, and it can, mm -hmm. it's not only only um, North Korean society does that. Every society, for sure, for sure. Uh, I can I think. You, um, yeah, and even mm -hmm. I can give you an example. And this is not something new in our society. It's so ancient. These phenomena that Plato in Plato caves, the story of Plato caves, he talk about. How people is brainwashed in a plateau caves, the the allegory of plateau caves. That's exactly how society mm -hmm. works and the power relation. You see how they work. So, yes, I admit I was brainwashed, but what I also um, did it was like I I pushed myself. I challenged myself, I pushed myself to, to, to go out there and do the research and, and verify, looking for the facts and verify things in order to, to learn about uh, what is true, what it meant to be true. Right. I, I wanted to ask, like, after you... First of all, I agree with you in the sense that we all live in some sort of subjective reality, like the cave allegory, as you mentioned, because you, you just grow up just accepting a lot of things at face value. Like we were talking about this inter before this interview, and you know, I had told you that you know before coming to mainland China, I I did, had the wrong ideas, and it wasn't. It was just like I just I was just misinformed. I wasn't researching it, and it's just you know. I guess if I make this into a question, when you look back on your time, uh, you know, in your youth in North Korea, is it too strong to say that, like, a lot of the reality was a lie? Or was it just like, was it, how exactly would you describe that? Like, I, because I, I don't know to what extent you felt like there was, to use your words, brainwashing, and to what extent was, there was reality. Basically. I wasn't. I wouldn't say it's everything lies. I would say it's rather in a subtle way of politicized, and from outside, I mean. So, well, it's a very subtle way of and and how I could say, for instance, um, when I was young, I took it as a normal thing that, uh. If I want to go to visit my friend's house, I need to go. I needed to go through a a bureaucratic 
very long bureaucratic uh, process to get permission and to visit my friend's house. Many people tend to say, oh, you cannot visit a uh, North Korean's house. Mm, it's not, actually, it's not, it's not that. You can visit, uh, there is a bureaucratic uh, process you need to go through. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and also uh, people, I mean, they will select which house you can go. That's linked to the freedom, yeah. So you don't have free mm. freedom to go to visit your house friend. So when I was young, growing up there, I didn't question that. I assumed that's the normal way. Mm. And then as I grew up, and I I started questioning why. Why I cannot go to my friend's house when I whenever I can I want to go or so these sort of things. Uh, when you are young, you don't realize that 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 shouldn't be that way. You don't realize that, mm -hmm. but as you grow up, you start questioning that mm -hmm. it should be yeah. changed the other way around. Yeah. Um, so that's the, an example, for instance, I can give you right now. And in, in the book, as you read the book, there are more examples. But uh, this is right now what I, I can I can give you an example of, mm -hmm. of, of questioning. Um, yeah. And uh, everything about North Korea. Once I left North Korea, what I was in shock, it was that how is it portrayed North Korea in a how outsiders portrays North Korea. It was all so wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so it was quite exaggerated where they say, um, yes, I recognize there is there is no this kind of freedom, freedom like um, you cannot, uh, uh, foreigners and uh, natives cannot interrupt, interrupt Really, that's true. Uh, mm -hmm. But you can do it through a system, like I said, bureaucratic system they they invented. And uh, what other the most average example I came across was was like uh, that. So, and in in North Korea, all the students. Um, must cut the hair or not the student or the woman must cut the hair because in that way they save money and i was like are you serious because they are not free they cannot if they are not free they cannot even cut the hair and that's that example was was that was average for me. How you can say that? That's that's really not true. And I was able to show them the the picture of my friends with the different lengths of the hair and the skirt. And even if they go further, they can research some images on the, on on Google to see if all mm -hmm. women's hair are equal. <laughs> It's it's just it's just um, um, unbelievable. That's mm -hmm. one of the example, and I right now it's not coming up, but uh, uh, many many things are very much exaggerated, exaggerated because it's taken in a way to politicize the country. I'm not I'm mm -hmm. not saying that North Korea is the perfect society, perfect country. That's not what I'm saying. However. Mm -hmm. I think politicizing the country image in order to isolate them is what I think is not right. Um, I think we should uh, say things how it is. Because mm -hmm. if, if we are just focusing on one single narrative, it, what we do, we divide people. One single narrative is really divisive. And uh, when we are divide, we divide each other. Is is a kind of it reminds me the colonial uh, ideology divide and rule. Exactly what it does when 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 you are telling someone only one perspective instead of 
inviting them to look all aspects that this society might have because it's a complicated society and historical background, you need no historical background and uh, um, so many factors are involved and without putting this in context just to believe what media is saying to you, hmm, I disagree with that. I disagree. Mm -hmm. I think there's uh, something to be said about the fact that we all live in our own realities and I think mm -hmm. even if whatever our reality is in that moment or whatever the reality is in today that is our de facto reality but something I was very struck by when I was reading the book was just given your background do you think that your reality was also filtered a certain way because your life in North Korea, you had quite a privileged upbringing in the sense mm -hmm. that you had a special protector, right? You had the leader of the country basically taking care of you. That's mm -hmm. not something that every North Korean will have. Uh, you know, you have, you have certain access, right? You have certain uh, a way of life. And I, again, I'm saying the reality thing because your reality is your reality. Like no one's going to take away that for you. But I'm also wondering, like, have you thought about, like, maybe, like, you also had a certain view of North Korea, both in the moment and later, because of your position, right? I, I, I guess, like, have you thought about that? Like, yeah, I don't know, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe you can, yes. maybe if you can comment on that, that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I never denied that I, I, um, I am privileged. I, I would say, I, let me define define this to a certain degree I'm privileged because I was born as a I was born and I was raised by these two post-colonial leaders so that gives me like you said an unowned access to to many things yeah so mm -hmm. I recognize in that degree I am uh, privileged, but here, if you look at, if you look at closer, we are talking about inter intersectionality. Yeah, I don't know if you have heard about the term intersectionality. Intersectionality is about the, the privilege of a certain uh, individual, how it manifests. So let me explain it this way. So I'm privileged because of this background I have. However, if you look at in a society where I lived, I I was minority. Make, make sense? Make sense yes. what I'm saying? Make sense? So I was a minority. Yes. As a minority, I do not have many access that Korean. My, uh, my friends had in the society, I did not have. And uh, mm -hmm. so, in that sense, they are privileged, yeah, because they have that mm -hmm. access. Sure. So, when I'm saying I'm privileged, yes, I'm privileged in a certain degree, but not absolutely uh, privileged over everyone else in the society. Mm -hmm. And the um, example I just gave you, yeah. And that is revealed mm. when, in the book I mentioned, precisely that's why I talk about in the class of, of when, we were, uh, um, when we were learning uh, the Korean history, which is not mine. I am minority, which is not mine. And then biology class, you might remember when I was talking about those classes, uh, in uh, boarding school, so when you when you look at that, I am isolated. I do not have the same privilege as my classmates have in a society. In relation to the society, I might have privilege economically over them, or power, because of my my friend, uh, my um, my fathers. So it's a relative, mm -hmm. 
the privilege is always relative. And one more thing I want to mention, because of, of, of this fact that we have this privilege, Kim Il-sung was very much aware of this. Um, bear in mind Kim Il-sung is someone who, who, who grew up, almost grew up in China, in Kilim. You know, you know, in, I think you pronounce Jilin in Chinese, Jilin in Korean is Kilim. It's um, the north part in a, uh, where the, um, the border between mm -hmm. China and there are so many Koreans there. So he, he grew up there during the Japanese occupation and he fought against Japanese. So he's someone that he got, he got through all this difficulty. If I can say difficult, he fought. It wasn't easy back then, his life until he came mm -hmm. back and then it's, it's a long story. So he, he was very much aware of what's the privilege and the raising the people. So he told us actually, you are privileged, but he removed many of privileged in order to make us that you must know, you must be aware, raise awareness in us and be humble. That mm -hmm. was kind of everyday sermon from Kim Il Sung. Be humble, mm -hmm. know you are privileged. However, use that privilege for the social construct in your country. It was kind of mm -hmm. sermon every day, humbleness, humbleness. Mm -hmm. So he mm. was, yeah, so something, when you say, I had a privilege in, in Korea. Yes, I did, but certain degree. In certain degree, I had a privilege. And also, and on top of that, like I said, Kim Il-sung made sure to remove many privilege. You know, that, that's why he sent us to the boarding, military boarding school. Because in Korea, many people say, if you go send the children to military, you make them people, person. That's mm. why he sent us such a discipline, very difficult school, where we had to wake up at five o'clock in the morning running. Why? Because he was removing us that privilege. Right. He tried to remove Trying to that, uh, add uh, yeah. a discipline. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm and gain uh, mm -hmm. life value. That's why he decided that school for us. Mm. And then when that's I very interesting. Yeah, because yeah. It, it means there's a kind of um, a mindfulness about yeah. privilege and, and yeah. just mindfulness. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, I think privilege, it's, it's not a bad thing. I realize that some people tend to think as a bad thing. As long as you are aware of your privilege, you are privileged, and you use that privilege as a tool to make the work of, let's say you are a policymaker, to produce mm -hmm. a better policy that will help others, that privilege is good because you are using that, that privilege as a tool to make a better good. Make sense what I'm trying to mm. tell you? So not just yes. being arrogant and using your your privilege just for your own sake. No. Mm -hmm. If you're aware, that's mm -hmm. why it's important. He, they were instilling us, yes, you are privileged, but be aware of that and use that privilege for good, for the society. You were separated at such a young age from your, your father. Your father was the first president of your country. And you did something very extraordinary later on is that you attempted to learn about your father in, more, in a more factual, reality-based way. And you, um, you did a lot of work in this area. So can you tell me about what you did exactly and, and just maybe more about your father in general? Right, so we, I need to put in context the people. Um, they can they can Google my father name, Francisco Macias, and they will see all the bad things that 
they climb Matthias Heston. So I have to I'm... admit that I I googled it, um, and I have to admit that yes, um, I'll just say it like uh, what I saw was that the history books said that he was one of the most uh, brutal dictators of the country. That yes. um, he did many things that were that were ugly. I'll just put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I read as well when I left Pyongyang. So you can imagine I was in shock. I was I was really I did not have a guidance how to deal with this kind of feelings. So I was and on top of that uh, arriving in Madrid the first thing in uh, in Elport, Barajas Elport. I heard when I heard that when the um, how you call, call it the, the security, the, the migration security in the airport, they saw my passport. Uh, they realized that I was Guinean. They they started bad mouthing Matthias. They didn't realize I was Matthias' daughter, but what they realized I was a Guinean, a Kutu Guinean. So they started bad mouthing and. That was the first shock, and on top of that, I was going through the cultural shock, language, food, everything, all together. All so I went in a depression, almost depression, and um, I locked myself three months in the room. I didn't want to go out. I didn't want to speak to anyone and talk and I'm trying to understand what's going on and who was my father why people are saying this about my father when when i what i knew about my father through kim il -sung was completely different so i was in that who to believe who is telling the truth and uh, after three months, I just decided, I said to myself, enough crying. I need to stand up and find out what's the truth, who is telling the truth. So, but the first thing I needed to do, it was the language, because my Spanish, like I said earlier, was not really good. So I did the, again, Spanish course there in Zaragoza, because... Uh, when I arrived in Spain, I I stopped in Madrid, but I I went to live in Zaragoza. It's a north. It's in north. It's a uh, it's a city in north of Spain. And I did this study, and I started to investigate to the do the research about Matthias. I started actually with a, um, a Guinean community because. I had easy access to them first, and um, I, it was divided opinion about Matthias back then. Well, I'm talking about 90s, yeah, 90, 90. I arrived in Madrid in 94, so we're talking about 90s, and the, 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 the opinion was divided completely. Those people who said um, um, it wasn't directly him, but um, indirectly, because um, he didn't he didn't punish those enough who was killing the people, and uh, on the other hand, there was these people saying, "Oh no, that's absolutely political uh, lies by Spain," because uh, back then. Spanish government didn't like Matthias. He wasn't the candidate they wanted. In fact, um, they tried to kill him. They failed. And many, many lies was invented, invented. And his speech was manipulated in a political, uh, uh, politicized. So again, I was more and more getting into the confusion because now it was kind of half and half the, the opinion about my father. And so, but on the, 
I kept interviewing many people, unions. And then as I, my interview progressed, I was really lucky. People was introducing me, uh, uh, talk to this person, talk to this person. Uh, this person uh, lived that era, they know. And uh, I was able to uh, interview Spaniard as well, a lot of Spaniards. And I was surprised. I expected many Spaniards to talk badly about my father. But those who, who were not politicians were, were, were telling me that that's not true. It's a, it's a Spain, our government, I mean, Spaniard, our government politics because they didn't want him. That's not true. So, uh, so it's, it was, the confusion was, uh, like I said, I was getting more confusion because it's really, it's like, you don't know who is, I was keep asking, who was this person? Who was so controversial for, 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 for many body, um, for many body, on the other hand, many, many people adore him. So I needed to know also from a kind from person who, with academic study, like a lawyer or politician. So I was looking for his lawyer, Antonio Garcia Trevijano. Young Antonio Garcia Trevijano is, it was a very important person in the independence of Equatorial Guinea because who he was the person who was um, advising my father group when they were um, fighting for the independence. So Antonio Garcia, the lawyer Spaniard, a Spanish lawyer, he knew really all the process of decolonization because it was done thanks to him. He is the one who knew, uh, even dropped the 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 um the constitution of the country of of Equatorial Guinea, but it didn't go through because Spain said no. But the first draft of the constitution was drafted by by this lawyer, so he really really know what he's talking about. And when I went, when I decided he was living back then in Madrid. Um, when I decided to to go his house to meet him, I was really like, I said to myself, well, I don't care. I will, I accept anything. I will accept anything. If, if he said, yes, my father was a killer, I will accept it. And that's how it is. And if he, uh, he said that was political lies, but I would ask him some proof. The con put me in the contest in a explain me that in a in a very uh, um, academic and logical uh, way. So I got I got there with this thing thinking. When I arrived in his her, his home, he opened the door. He was waiting for me, and uh, the first. I remember that day like yesterday. The first question I, I, I did to him was, was my father a killer? And he started laughing and laughing, laughing. And he said, uh, at the same time, he said, wow, you are very brave. Uh, his um, brave go because not everybody able to do to make that question about their own father. And he said, um, he began with a, it was really a long conversation. It took, I arrived at 12 o'clock and I left the house at 5 o'clock. So, and um, he said the short, the short answer he gave me, it was, no, he wasn't a killer. And when I heard that, wow, James, you can't imagine. I Just uh, relieved, right? There relieved, was, yeah. Yes, relief. Mm -hmm. Relief. And I was crying, and wow. <laughs> Even now I get emotional because I remember that day. So it was mm -hmm. big relief. And then he said, um, in order to understand, he needed to put me in the context 
political context or decolonization, what was going on in Guinea, what was going on in Spain back then. And he told me, in order to understand all these things, I needed to study international relations. And then also he mentioned about the UN, you know, it was the era when the UN um, was, uh, how is it called, right now, I don't remember, you know, that giving the independence to African countries. So actually Spain was, was uh, the UN was pressuring Spain. UN was pressuring in Spain to give the, the uh, independence. So he explained me, you know, all, and then also the trial, we talked about the trial, Mafia's trial, which was a show trial, because they couldn't prove any accusation they had. And also we talked about um, the, the lawyer, he's actually Chilean, he's from Chile, but he worked for international court, and um, he was the uh, uh, he was invited by the trial that uh, took place in Equatorial Guinea, just as a, to be present, yeah, uh, mm-hmm. as a represent representant of the um, the international court. And then after that, he wrote the the, uh, the report of our court. And so Antonio Garcia has that that report. And we went one by one, every pages, and Antonio was just um, refusing everything because the first thing he said to me is like, a lawyer cannot start saying, in my opinion, in my opinion, in my opinion, in my opinion. It's not his opinion what matter. It's the fact and the proof. And if there is a, a uh, I can't remember the word, there is any, any um, suspect. You mean like, that, like a, oh, suspicion. Okay. Small suspicion. You cannot condemn someone. You need to prove against that suspicion. You need to prove that uh, this. There is a word, um, legal term for that. I I forgot right now. Because right now I forgot in English. But there are term for that. If mm. and then there is a innocence. Um, what's it called? I mentioned it in the book. Right now I can't remember. But there is in the book. Yeah. So you need ultimately you need really to prove that that person was guilty before In, they, innocent uh um, unless proven unless otherwise exactly. yeah yeah exactly yeah. so my father did not did not have that that mm-hmm. um how i can say they didn't give him that chance because this was political mm-hmm. they needed to kill him they needed to eliminate him from the uh Indian and spanish political scenery Mathias was mm-hmm. an obstacle for Spain because mm-hmm. he didn't he didn't work for the um, benefit. And also during the trial, my, my, my Mathias said um, his last speech, which is in the, is on YouTube. He said he said he is a responsible as a poli- as a head of the. Of state, he was responsible of what happened, but he never. He said, "I never signed any document or sending people to kill. I take the per, uh, responsibility of what happened during my Monday." So that's political responsibility he's taking there. Makes sense mm-hmm. what I'm, what he's trying to. But the, there is a. Uh, there is a difference. Uh, I'll explain you why it's different. So Mafia says, I'm responsible. Because imagine it like this. You are a father of a family. Your children are behaving bad. You said, as a father, I'm responsible of behavior of these children. Even if you didn't teach these children to, children to behave bad. But you are saying, as a father, I'm responsible. That's quite politician responsibility he's getting. And he mm-hmm. acknowledged that in his uh, last speech. 
and at the same time he demand to go through a thorough investigation of what happened mm -hmm. but that yep. that was absolutely ignored no one took that account and yeah so it's it's it, it's very long. It's very long because I'm I'm writing my second book about about Matthias, and I will. I'm actually editing it now, and I will put it in detail in that book. But it's it's a it's a very very sad. It's, it, it was a very very sad because the trial was a show trial, completely a show trial, and. Mm -hmm. Even the people in the village, because also Nate, we need to take account that Guinea, as African country, is very much linked to the tradition in a country. So uh, the old people, all the people in the uh, uh, in the village where he comes from, they said, actually, they said there is no prove that Matthias has done this. You guys are killing. You're killing him just because of the political um, um, uh, purposes, reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what I I I spend my half of adulthood researching about what happened, who was Matthias and what happened. And uh, mm -hmm. I gather it now, and I am going to put them in a word. I mean, in a word, but I'm going to publish that. And I'm mm -hmm. in process of, of uh, editing it, because I think it's mm -hmm. a history. We need to... Uh, I mainly, I, I, I sometimes I think, I, I may, mainly, because it's history, the new generation don't know. In Guinea, new generation, many new generation now, they don't even know who Matthias was. Mm -hmm. And is the person who signed the independence of the country. Right. So, yes. So, it's, a, it's, it's what I'm, I am trying to do. And uh, when I left Korea, is what I did, a research. And now, I... I mean, I keep discovering many things, but main part that I think I, uh, is done. I just need to mm -hmm. organize it, edit it, and publish. So, Monica, just to end this on a a more personal note, mm -hmm. what is the fondest memory that you have of your father? If I'm honest, I don't have a memory of him because my memory begins when when we arrived in in in, in North Korea in Pyongyang. The only memory mm -hmm. I have him, so my memory is just like I I think because of all this emotional experience or trauma I have gone through, my brain blocked in order. I think they said my sister is is a is a doctor and she explained it in a easy way. She said that the brain have this me mechanism that's just block you in order to protect me. So I don't have mm -hmm. memory of my father, but sometimes I have this kind of like um, a image, very blue. It's not very clear, very blurry image of him. Not, I can't even see the face. It's just the back. Mm. Where we used to work in a in a taking us in a camp to to work on uh, because he used to have the um, uh, where he cultivated coffee, and he used to work there, and on the weekend he. Mm -hmm. According to my sister, he used to take us there to show us, at young age, how to to um, work, kind of this working spirit. Yeah, so that's what image. Only that very blue image I have. So 
I don't know. I I I don't have it. I don't have because it's like I said before, the brain does block my memories and my memory begin from since we arrived in Pyongyang in seven seventy seven seven ninety seventy nine. Yeah. Um uh, Monica, thank you so much for taking the time today to speak your truth. I think this is uh this is this is a wonderful conversation that we had and uh i i for those who have not had the chance to read the book uh please do check out monica's book black girl from pyongyang and it it sounds like there's a there's a new book that you're working on as mm -hmm. well to uh you know uncover more of the the truth in the history right of of your history of the people's history so um looking forward to it i mean uh, yeah thank you so much for taking the time today and thank you for having me really i appreciate it and i i hope um the people whoever gonna uh listen to this um can um can read my book and enjoy it and just see the different perspective of the historical event. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Why with James Sue. To support the show, please leave a rating on your favorite podcasting app, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any platform, really. It helps spread the word and tell others that you enjoy my work. Same goes for YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe and leave a comment. That helps get the word out and goes a long way. Thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you next time.